Emma Reynolds. Speaker, I campaign to remain. Um, I campaign for the UK to remain in the EU, but I accept the outcome of the referendum and I accept the, re the views of the majority of my constituents. Um, he has always defended, uh, from the back benches and the front bench, parliamentary sovereignty. That's why I'm struggling to understand why he is seeking to deny members of this House an opportunity to feed in the views of their constituents on the government's negotiating strategy prior to triggering Article 50. This would not be to stop the triggering of Article 50, which I will vote for but it would be to help shape that negotiating strategy. Here, here. I, think, I think the Honourable Lady is, is misinterpreting what, what's been said. I mean, what we're saying is there's no point in having a vote in the House on Article 50 because all it can do is stop the, uh, the instruction that the British people have already given us. That's not to say we're not going to have debate after debate. I'm not going to appear in front of select committee after select committee, that we're not going to have all... And, and indeed, I am, of course, accessible to everybody in this House of all sides. So I, I do not see that as being a barrier to uh, her bringing forward the concerns of her constituents. Indeed, I strongly encourage her to do so as soon as possible. Dominic Robb. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join the chorus welcoming the Secretary of State to his post and indeed also welcome the statement by the Prime Minister about Britain becoming a global leader when it comes to free trade? And can I urge him to follow the example of Japan and indeed every other non European member of the G20 in engaging in free trade deals and negotiations, which is never to give up national control over immigration or indeed pay a fee? Uh, my. Honourable friend, and again, old friend, is, uh, is exactly right. There, there are the most successful countries in the world uh, in uh, establishing free trade deals. might surprise members of this House, places like Chile uh, or South Korea. And they never, ever give up anything other than the access to their own market in exchange for a free trade deal. Not one of them gives up money, not one of them gives up immigration rights. Yeah. 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 Mr Kevin Jones. Can I agree with the right on gentleman that the British people made a decision on the 23rd of June and it's one that we should respect. I'll certainly have the one arguing for another referendum. We now need to make the best of those negotiations. But you will no, no doubt know that there is uncertainty, certainly, for example, in the north-east of England, around the future of EU structural funding. Can I give a guarantee today that those funds, once we come out of the EU, will be actually replaced by the government? Well, the first thing I can't speak for a future government, as you well know, is that will be beyond the next election. But what I will say to him is this. I've, I promised to another, another member on, on that side of the House that we'll put in the library the letter from the Chancellor uh, under, underwriting, effectively, many of the structural funds, uh, the research grants and the common agricultural uh, policy funding. Uh, that is already in place. Uh, and uh, if he looks at that carefully, it's better him to do that than to, to, uh, to rely, on, rely on my uh, uh, rather inaccurate estimate on it. Neil Carmichael. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I uh, welcome uh, my right honourable friend to his new post, although the precise title was never a, the stuff of my dreams. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, it is a new dawn, a new day, and you've got a job to do. So I would like to ask him, what has he done so far about the university sector, which is struggling with the research and development issues, which is considering the free movement of people issues, and which is thinking also about the single market? Well, the the, firstly, the Chancellor uh, uh, made some arrangements which helped uh, underpin the current circumstances. I mean, the, the um, student loan uh, companies uh, made some arrangements and I saw Universities UK myself the other day to find out what other concerns they have and we are pursuing those concerns. So, so I, think, uh, I don't think we can be accused of not paying proper attention to that sector. We are very conscious that it's a sensitive sector in these terms. And as for the title of my department, I don't know whether he was the parliamentary wag that ended up calling it Department X, but thank you very much. Dr John Pugh that question. Fifteen percent of our academics are currently EU citizens, and we'd like more. What is being done to give any long-term security? The movement of academics, researchers in particular, I guess, in and out of British universities, antedates entry to the European Union by a very long margin. Britain is a science superpower. We are a science superpower standing on our own two feet. And that will continue after we leave the EU as well as now. 
Mr. Bernard Jenkins. Speaker. Uh, congratulations to my right honourable friend on his appointment. And uh, can I remind him that, of course, the Remain campaign was characterised by a campaign to spread fear and uncertainty yeah, about yeah, the future yeah. of this country. And they're still at it. Oh, yes, they're still at it. And they're trying to make this process as complicated and as protracted as possible in order to try and frustrate it. Can I warn him, can I warn him that, in fact, it would be a mistake to try and agree everything about our new relationship with the European Union by the time we leave? Leaving the European Union is but a first step here, towards here. establishing a new relationship with our European partners and towards our establishment of a new relationship with the rest of the world. And what the business community wants and what the country wants and indeed what many in the European Union want is speed and certainty as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Well, I hope my right hand friend wasn't accusing me of being a member of the Remain uh, group, but uh, uh, what I will say to him is one of the things that I noticed over the summer whilst I was poring over the vast tomes of papers that come with this job uh, was the tendency to blame everything on Brexit. Uh, and uh, ranging from, I think it was uh, bank layoffs, which were nothing to do with Brexit, through to the state of the Italian bond market, which had nothing to do with Brexit. Uh, so he's quite right there. But the, the simple truth is that we've got to get this right. We will do it as expeditiously as possible. We will not delay one day more than is necessary to do the job we have to do. But it is a complicated and uh, extensive relationship which we have to untangle. And we will do so, and we will do so in good time. Karen Buck. Speaker, two months ago I asked uh, the Home Office Minister for urgent clarification on the status of the EU nationals resident in Britain, including the 36,000 EU nationals in the London Borough of Westminster. And they are people who are going about their jobs and setting up businesses, and they need confirmation of their status. And I was told this was going to be a priority. What does he mean by priority? <laughs> Be, 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 I'll answer the question, but before I do, let me just say this. Uh, one of my concerns about that argument was that quite a lot of European Union citizens who are in Britain were being unnecessarily frightened by it. Bear in mind that leave to remain is pretty much automatic if you've got a clean criminal record after five years, right? Uh, and citizenship after six years. And this process is not going to happen for two years. So if you've been here three years already, you're, you're, you're in a pretty safe place. But that being said, the Prime Minister and I have both said in terms, we want to provide a generous guarantee to European Union citizens in this country, who are already in this country, and I am confident that can be delivered so long as we get proper civilised treatment for British citizens abroad, who are, after all, our responsibility too. Mr Philip Davis. Speaker, could I uh, congratulate my right honourable friend on his appointment? There could be uh, nobody better for the job. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. In order to help the uh, benches opposite, who have badly uh, lost touch with working class voters that they once claimed to represent, would he agree with me that people voted in the referendum to leave because they wanted to control immigration? They wanted to stop handing over more than £10 billion a year net to the European Union, and they wanted laws to be decided for this country in this House and not in Brussels. And will he therefore make a commitment that in his negotiation the red lines for him will be full control over immigration, no contribution to the EU budget, and that all laws will be decided in this House and none will be decided in the European Union? My <laughs> somebody on the front bench muttered she should be all right with that. Um, the, I shan't say who, uh, but I, I demurred from uh, from second. I demurred. I beg your pardon, Mr. Speaker. I demurred from second guessing uh, our own negotiating position in six months for the Labour Party, and and I am and I am going to demur in this case. I'll say this. To, I'll say this to him. I'll say this to him that the. Uh, decision of the British people, I think, was first and foremost about control of our own destiny, yeah. over and above anything else, and that's what we're seeking to return. The Secretary of State is an immensely cerebral denizen of this House, and therefore there is no need for him at any time to imitate a turnstile. <laughs> He's best avoided. Mr Liam Byrne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I also welcome the Secretary of State? Um, to his place, but can I say to him that many of us this afternoon wanted rather more detail than a few more 
reheated old sound yeah, bites yeah, this yeah, afternoon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we know the old slogans about Brexit means Brexit, and what we got this afternoon was an essay in how waffle means waffle. Yeah. <laughs> so, can I commend to him the approach of the Japanese government, uh, which has spent the last seven weeks not simply going to the lengths of setting up a Brexit commission, but has actually gone to the lengths of reporting its results. Yes. I hope that diligence and speed will inspire his work in his department over the months to come. But I want to press him on his answer to my right honourable friend, the member for Wallasey. He made big play in his statement today about his ambition, which I share, to restore parliamentary sovereignty. Will he therefore give this House a vote on the final package for Brexit whenever and however it is finally negotiated? Well, I think, firstly, let me just say to him on this issue of detail, he should know well that uh, what we are doing is not simply looking at the interests of a limited number of companies uh, and a limited number of banks, which uh, is obviously the issue for the Japanese government. We are looking at the interests of a whole economy. So it will take just a touch longer, and given his, given his uh, prior experience, he should know that, and he should know it well. Now, in terms of the uh, uh, position with respect to parliamentary approval, I suspect there will be a great deal of things brought before the House during the course of the negotiation, not just at the end. Uh, and uh, there will be plenty of opportunity to both speak and vote on it. Dr Julian Lewis. Yeah, 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 yeah. The uh, very welcome appointment of my right honourable friend and indeed of the uh, Foreign Secretary and yeah, the International yeah, Trade yeah, Secretary yeah, yeah, certainly yeah. shows that the Prime Minister means what she says and that Brexit will really happen. Yeah, yeah. But some people on the losing side hope to sabotage the result of the referendum by delaying the process indefinitely. Yeah. So is my right honourable friend absolutely confident that, come what may, the UK will be outside the European Union well before the date of the next general yeah, election? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I've said very plainly, this will be uh, not, we won't trigger Article 50 before the end of this year, but we will trigger it as expeditiously as possible. Uh, the Article 50 process takes two years. Extending it takes unanimity amongst every other uh, member of the European Union. He can make his own judgment on both the probability of that and the arithmetic that that delivers. Mr Robert Flello. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The people of Stoke-on-Trent voted overwhelmingly to leave the European Union. Yeah. Yeah. I will therefore work tirelessly and do everything I can to make sure we get the best efforts and get the best deal out of that uh, exit. But to help me and other members on both sides of this House to do that, can we please have, firstly, in the, the House of Commons Library, details of what's going on, what's being looked at, timetables when they're available, rather than, dare I say it, Secretary of State, a very um, generalised uh, explanation today. And secondly, can I put an early bid in that he meets with members of Parliament across the House in North Staffordshire uh, <coughs> to hear firsthand the issues of great concern to those who voted for exit, as well as others, in our city and just outside? Um, let me say two things, young gentlemen, one of which you didn't ask, but I'm going to tell him anyway. Uh, and, and, and it's this. You know, I take very seriously... I mean, when I talked about the British industrial working class voting for Brexit, it was his sort of seat that I had in mind. Uh, and I take that very seriously. And I take those votes and those people and their lives very seriously indeed. And so I will see uh, uh, his group uh, with the specific aim of identifying their concerns and their worries and their futures and the prospects and the opportunities that go with it. And to that end, uh, we will also, I'll do what I can to make uh, this process as open as possible. Now, let me say to him, it's a negotiation and you don't always play cards with everything turned up. He will understand that. Uh, but nevertheless, nevertheless, I will do what I can to make it as open as possible. In terms of, he, he said it's, uh, what I've said today is rather general. Well, I've been talking about the process. You know, 
department is 180 people. It's quadruple over the course of August. Um, this is a fast developing process, and I mean it to be open. That's why I asked for this statement on the first day back, so that the process can be open to everybody in the House. And that's what we'll do, and perhaps we'll start with him. Mr. Peter Bone. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, oh, um, so can, I, can I welcome <laughs> the Secretary of State to his position, not least because he headed up Conservative Go? And unfortunately, one of the drawbacks of him being made Secretary of State, he can no longer wear the green tie. Of course you can. Um, could he say, um, he, he's given, he's been as clear as he can be, and he's just one of his great advantages, straight talking, but could he give his best estimate now of when he thinks? the date he thinks we will actually leave. His best estimate. We won't hold him to it. Nobody will be that worried. But just give us a date. <laughs> That's a very good try. Um, I'm sure in his youth my honourable friend was a great seducer, but I'm not going to be seduced. <laughs> uh, I don't think we want too much information on that front. Um, Mrs Helen Goodman. Speaker. The Right Honourable Gentleman has always been a great defender of parliamentary democracy and throughout this afternoon he's emphasised that it's complex and that there are trade-offs to be made, which is why it's so incomprehensible to many of us that he doesn't want the House to have a vote before the path is chosen for how to trigger Article 50. And I wonder if he's aware of the statement made by the former Foreign Secretary, Lord Haig, that it would be sensible to endorse the start of the negotiations, a defeat for terms of exit after lengthy negotiations could leave the UK in limbo. I always listen very carefully to my fellow Yorkshiremen. Um, but the, let me say this to the Honourable Lady. The reason for the uh, question of Article 50 not being put to a vote of the Commons is simply this. I am a great supporter of parliamentary democracy because it is our manifestation of democracy under most circumstances. On, the, on this unique circumstance, we have 17.5 million direct votes, which tells us what to do. And I can't imagine what, this, what, the House, what would happen to the House in the event that it overturned 17.5 million votes. So I don't want to bring the House into disrepute by doing that. What I want to do is make, have the House make decisions which are effective and bite into the process, and that's what will happen. Mr John Barron. Welcoming my right honourable friend to his post, may I stress to him the importance of achieving fairness when it comes to our immigration policy. Does he agree that whatever criteria eventually guides that policy, we must have an immigration policy that no longer discriminates against the rest of the world outside the EU as our present policy does? Well, I think my honourable friend makes a, a very good point. He has campaigned on this for a very, very long time, I know. Uh, and uh, it will, what I, all I can say, I mean, bear in mind, I'm not the Home Secretary. My job is to bring the power back so the Home Secretary can exercise it. But I'm, I'm quite sure she will listen to what he said and pay great attention to it. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to date, the Japanese government have provided the British people with more detail on what Brexit means than the UK government. <coughs> I think most of us had hoped that we'd hear more this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm sad to say that what we've heard has been sadly lacking in detail, and I think could best be described as the ladybird guide to exiting the European Union. Yeah. <coughs> uh, it's not a petty point, Mr. Speaker, because like many other honourable members this summer, I've been speaking with major employers in my constituency particularly the financial sector in Edinburgh South West and the universities of Harriet Watt and Napier, which are huge employers. They're all very keen to see a detailed explanation of what Brexit will mean for them, their institutions and their employees, my constituents. When is the Minister going to give this House that sort of a detailed explanation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the first point to make is we've been in the European Union for 40 odd years. The links are very complicated, the uh, effects on much of our society are quite complex and some of them quite expensive to replicate. So we'll get, she'll get the information she is uh, asking for, but she'll get it stepwise as it comes out, as we generate it, uh, and it will be accurate and useful at that point in time. A few months is not going to be a problem for her constituents. Thank you, Speaker, may I also uh, join in welcoming the three 
Secretaries of State to the front bench, like magnificent dreadnoughts at anchor. We wait for them to set sail, uh, enforcing the Pax Britannica. Uh, may I echo also the comments about the importance of science, but also bring to the Secretaries of State attention the creative industries, which grow three times faster than the UK economy as a whole. They rely, to a certain extent, on European regulations, like the poetically named Audiovisual Media Services Directive and the General Data Protection Regulation. Could I gently nudge their interests near to the front of the queue as the Secretary of State takes us out of the European Union? I say to my honourable friend, my right honourable friend, that, that uh, he almost doesn't need to nudge it. I am very conscious of uh, the uh, issues relating particularly to the film industry. Uh, it's a very mobile industry, both in capital and personnel terms, uh, and it's one, therefore, we're looking at very soon. Indeed, it's one of the roundtables I was talking about earlier. Stephen Timms. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State is well placed to uh, address the problems faced with EU rules by Tatum Lyle in my constituency, and I welcome him to his position. But it sounds from his earlier answers as though he thinks it is possible that at the end of the two-year negotiation, Britain will continue to be a member of the European Union single market. Can he confirm he thinks that is possible, and in what circumstances he thinks that would be the outcome? Yeah, very good. Very what I said, and I apologise, honourable gentlemen, if I misled him, is that uh, I am seeking to get the best possible access. It does not necessarily mean being a member of the single market. There are, as was listed earlier, plenty of countries that do have that access without making the sorts of uh, concessions that we have had to as a member of the Union. Mr Nigel Evan. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. It is good to see the three... Brexiteer cabinet ministers sitting together, all working for one nation with one referendum, with one clear decision. Um, despite the fact that some people, including Tony Blair, who famously offered us a referendum and then took it away, have said that there's a chance that we still might be members of the European Union. Could he make absolutely clear that we are going to be leaving the European Union in its entirety? And when does he envisage us getting our hands on the Brexit dividend, the membership money, so that we can spend it on our priorities? The answer is yes, and at some point, once we've left. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and may I welcome the Secretary of State to his position and also thank him for one of his early visits being to Northern Ireland. But will he make sure he always talks to the official opposition? And when listening to the official opposition, what I've been picking up from businesses throughout the summer is uncertainty, which we already talked about. But it's absolutely key, particularly for Northern Ireland, that we don't slip into a recession. Because for us, we're always on the edge of it, and it slips out. Would you keep that foremost to his mind? Very much so. One of the, one of the groups I met when I was in Northern Ireland was the... Uh, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland's new business advisory group, uh, who talked about exactly that. We were, we were there, sadly, on the day of the Caterpillar announcement, which was bad news, but it was nothing to do with Brexit. It was a problem of markets in the Far East. So we will have that clearly front and centre. Nick Herbert. Thank you, Mr Speaker, can I congratulate my right honourable friend on his resurrection? And uh, he spoke about the value of uh, free trade with the European Union when we leave it. That trade, of course, consists of the trade in goods and services. And the barriers to that trade are both uh, tariff barriers, which have been discussed extensively, but also non-tariff barriers, which have received rather less uh, attention. What reassurance can he give to the many businesses in this country in the services sector, which is particularly important uh, to us and is growing, uh, the trade with the European Union, with which is particularly important, that their interests uh, in continuing to ha have uh, non-tariff uh, barriers uh, removed will continue? Um, uh, I thank my honourable friend for that. Uh, that question, and of course, he is the author of the resurrection line I cited earlier. But the, uh, I'll say a couple of things to him. I'm tempted to use Gandhi's comment about Western civilization when talking about uh, the single market in services. It would be a good idea. Uh, it, is, it is somewhat patchy, to say the least. And one of the major parts of this big exercise we're doing is trying to establish exactly what the non tariff barriers are and where they can and cannot be resolved. So I take, in, take his point entirely on board. It's the one area, of course, where we have a surplus uh, with, with Europe, and it's one where we want to keep a surplus with Europe. Martin Doherty-Hughes. 
Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, the industrial working class of Western Bartonshire voted overwhelmingly to remain within yeah. the European yeah. Union. And the industrial working class of Western Bartonshire voted to become a part of a sovereign, independent Scotland. Yeah, yeah. And with that, I welcome the Secretary of State to their position. The Honourable Member for South Down, who is no longer in their position, posed a very interesting question which requires further investigation in relationship to our relationship with Ireland. It is not just an economic relationship, but a social one and a familial one shared across the length and breadth of not only this chamber, but the dial errand itself, and is reciprocal. When the Secretary of State meets possibly the Foreign Minister of Ireland this week in Dublin, and possibly the Taoiseach himself, will he return to the floor of the House and make a statement on the discussions they have had in relation not only to the common travel area, but to the Ireland Act of 1949, so that those relationships can be continued when this part of the United Kingdom leaves the European Union. Well, what I'll say to him is this, that when the United Kingdom leaves the European Union, the common travel area will continue. Richard Drax. Hey, Mr Speaker, can I welcome my right honourable friend to his post? Um, the fishing industry was once the proud and large industry and envied around the world, not least in, in Scotland. Uh, many of my constituents, many of our fishermen in my constituents, see leaving the EU as a huge opportunity. Can I ask him to assure them and other fishermen and potential new fishermen around the United Kingdom that this will be very high on his list of priorities, including potentially taking the 200 mile limit back? One of the, one of the groups I've met already is the, uh, uh, is the fishermen. Um, the views um, uh, uh, yes, the answer to his initial question uh, about priority is yes. Wh what form it takes will depend on what's the interest of our fishermen, uh, because they do have some interest in other waters as well. So uh, I won't say yes to his second uh, uh, suggestion, but the, in terms of priority, absolutely. Gisela Stewart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whether we were on the side of remain or on the side of leave, I think we should now be on the side of doing things in the interest of the British public. And in that context, the Secretary of State did mention the rights of EU citizens, and he referred that he was sure we could arrive at a general settlement. Could I suggest to him that people do worry about their future, whatever the legal framework is, that, that these negotiations, both with other EU member states and the rights of UK citizens there and here, is a top priority, because these uncertainties deserve to be settled as soon as possible. Hey, this honourable lady, I agree with her. It's a high priority, and if I can accelerate it, if I can accelerate it, I will. And Dr. Andrew Murison, welcoming my right honourable friend to his post. He's absolutely the right man to do this important yeah. work. Yeah. He will appreciate the complete economic illiteracy of the European Union on the one hand, writing very big cheques to middle-income and developing countries to bail out their flailing economies on the one hand, and on the other. Uh, 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 giving uh, 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 unequal access to European uh, Union markets. That is clearly hampering their ability to be equal partners rather than supplicants. How can Britain do better? Well, I'm, I take my honourable friend, my right honourable friend's uh, point very well, but I am loath to offer uh, free advice to people who are negotiating partners in this <laughs> when it is a central point of their own policy to put right. Peter Kyle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Secretary of State accept that we will never attain the goal of being a beacon of free trade unless the British financial services industry retains free and full access to the single market? <laughs> Well, that's just one element of free trade, I'd say to him, but uh, uh, of course we want to maintain as much access as is possible to do, and that's what the negotiators will be aiming at. Yep. Connor Burns. Welcome my right honourable friend to his place on the front bench. 
and his Secretary of State colleagues either side of him. We have great faith in what they are going to deliver. Would he agree with me that not liking the outcome of a democratic vote is no justification to seek to overturn the outcome of a democratic vote, however much sympathy we may have for honourable members opposite with their forthcoming democratic vote? Um, This is a great opportunity for the United Kingdom. Is it not now time to put the arguments of the referendum behind us and back Britain's government in getting a good deal for Britain. We are changing the direction of our country. This is not just the government's negotiation. This is Britain's negotiation, and this House should unite behind them. As always, my honourable friend speaks for England. Sir Nick Dakin. Speaker, Greater Lincolnshire and Peterborough FSB recently briefed me that um, confidence of their members is at a four-year low. They want, like all of us, to make Brexit work and are keen to work with government to bring that about. But they are keen to retain access to the single market and also keen to retain ease of access to European labour. Um, Most of all, they want certainty. What um, roadmap to certainty can the Secretary of State give um, these members? Let me first deal with the issue of, of uh, the immediate uncertainty or loss of confidence. There's undoubtedly a downward dip in, the, uh, in confidence immediately after Brexit, partly because of all of the terrible things that were said would happen. They haven't happened now, and the confidence is recovering. So put, put that to one side for the moment. In terms of access to markets, I'm absolutely on their side, and that's what we'll seek to do. But we have to take on board the fact that um, the sheer level of immigration into the UK from the European Union has caused social issues, maybe economic issues for for low paid workers and the like, and we have to balance that against the corporate interest, and that's what we will do, and try to get the outcome which is best for Britain. James Dudridge. Speaker, as someone that supported Brexit, can I uh, congratulate and um, uh, offer uh, success to the creation of the department uh, that the Secretary of State heads. But can I gently ask him when he hopes to close down the department and return the function of the Minister of Europe to the Foreign Office? (laughs) (laughs) My my desire to return to the backbenches is overwhelming, so it will be as soon as I can. (laughs) Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State will undoubtedly be aware of our debate later today on the tampon tax and the Government Amendment, which makes its abolition subject to the UK's EU obligations, not just our obligations of EU membership. Can you tell the House whether any exit agreements with the EU could include requirements on the UK to set minimum rates of VAT even after our membership ends? And in that scenario, can you give us an absolute guarantee that we will be allowed to zero rate women's sanitary products? What what she has just described is one of the reasons, not the only one, but one of the many reasons for wanting to leave the European Union. Being able to set your own tax rate is a fundamental of an independent country, and that's what we want to be once more. Dr Sarah Wollaston. Speaker, I warmly welcome my right hon. Friend and the whole front bench team to their important new roles making a success of Brexit. Can the Secretary of State set out what discussions he's had with the EU Trade um, Commissioner, who has taken a much tougher line on Article 50, um, because we all agree that it's in everyone's interest to get on and negotiate before we actually exit, but in a recent interview she's indicated that, that won't be the case. Yes, but she is not in a position, frankly, to tell either the uh, Secretary of State for International Trade what he can do, um, subject to meeting European law, and European law in this case means uh, not putting a free trade agreement into effect until we leave. That's the limit. Uh, In terms of other discussions and negotiations, commissioners have tried to say that we can't speak to uh, other members of the European Union, which is sort of silly. We are, uh, we are an ongoing member of the European Union, we take our responsibility seriously, and it is implausible that in our conversations with them we won't actually talk about what's coming next. Ms McInnes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am surprised by uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman's assertion that the mandate for Brexit is overwhelming. And can I remind him that 16 and 17 year olds whose future as European citizens will be most affected by this decision were denied a vote? And to ask, while he's speaking with stakeholders, 
What steps will he take to ensure that these young people are now given a voice and a say in their future? Well, when one, one, of the, one of the aspects of democracy is that one side wins and one side doesn't win. And, the, and it, it is certainly... The, I, there, was a, there was a sort of uh, punt from the Labour front bench that young people lost. That's certainly not true. What we are going to see in the future is a bigger, greater, more glorious country yeah. than we have already. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so just because he doesn't understand that doesn't mean that they lost. Now, the simple, to come back to her point, of course, uh, they may feel uh, at this point that, they, that their views uh, did not win the day. That's, that's, I'm afraid, part of the outcome of a democracy. It's our job to make sure that they gain from the outcome of that decision. Here, here. Mr Henry Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. In warmly welcoming my right hon. Friend to his uh, very well-deserved uh, position, uh, can I implore him to have early discussions with our right hon. Friends, uh, the Home Secretary and the Secretary of State for Transport, and indeed others, to ensure that the words European Union are removed at the earliest possible moment from UK passports and driving yeah. 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 Let's get back to me. I will draw his comments to their attention. <laughs> Mr. Pete Wishart. Mr. Speaker, can I say to the Secretary that that statement was 15 minutes of meaningless waffle from a Tory government, a clueless Tory government, who have absolutely no plan for this accidental Brexit. And can I say to him, it's no point just dictating to the people of Scotland when it comes to this Brexit. 62% of the Scottish people voted to remain within the European Union and every single one of Scottish local authorities. How should their views be now be progressed? And a million Scots uh, voted to leave. And uh, something, and nobody, despite, despite the partisan use of this argument by the Scottish Nationalist Party for their own interests, despite that, dis despite, that uh, the, uh, <laughs> despite that, the simple truth is that the Scottish view on whether they should have independence or not has not changed by one jot. Uh, and that's, I think, an answer to the Honourable Gentleman's waffle. Sir Edward Lee. Yeah. 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 Uh, congratulations on resurrection after 18 years. Uh, it gives the rest of us hope that there is no <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't just places like Lincolnshire that delivered the Leave result. It was the Labour heartlands in the North and the Midlands. And my run right friend knows those heartlands very well indeed. Does he think it would have been helpful if the official Labour Party spokesman, if there is such a thing, had made absolutely clear that the people have spoken and this House, all members of the Conservative Party and the Labour Party are going to deliver this democratic result. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, I'm not holding my breath for that outcome. What I will say is this party, the Conservative Party, is the only party uh, willing to deliver on the people's decision. Yeah. Neil Griffith. Speaker, well, the Secretary of State's right honourable friend, the Environment Secretary, said during the referendum campaign that those with the big fields should do the sheep and those with the hill farms should do the butterflies. It would make much more sense, but it's only possible if we leave the EU. What reassurances can he give the farming communities, who are the lifeblood of rural Wales, that subsidies will continue to the more challenging to farm areas so that we are not turned simply into a big butterfly park? The, the first thing that happened, of course, was the, uh, the Chancellor underwrote uh, the CAP payments, and that was very important in its own right for confidence for exactly those people. Uh, and in the discussions with respect to both the departure from the European Union, the subsequent agricultural policy, uh, and indeed the subsequent trade policy, we are having uh, discussions about exactly those things, and we have very much in mind what she's saying. Mr Richard Graham. Speaker, I totally support the position of the Government not to rush into triggering Article 50, and I welcome the comments by the Secretary of State that he knows how important access to the single market is, both for our own businesses and for inward investors from growth markets like Asia. Does my right honourable friend agree that just as we are currently in the European Union but have various opt-outs, so in due course we shall be out of the European Union, but we'll have the ability to continue arrangements that work well for all sides, for example, Europol, 
and the European Health Insurance Card, which so many British families benefit from? It, the first premise of this is returning power to the control of this government and this parliament. How they deploy that power is entirely up to them, and I would think any sensible government would be involved in mutually beneficial activity. Uh, after all, Israel, uh, Israel uh, uh, subscribes to some of the uh, European uh, research operations. And it's not even nowhere near a member of the European Union. So, so I think that in, in those terms, he, uh, his point is, is well made. Yeah. George Kerivan. Would the Secretary of State repeat for the House the guarantee that he gave in Northern Ireland last week that his government will not seek to impose a hard border, a hard border that would restrict the free movement of people and labour between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic? And will he extend such a guarantee to Gibraltar and Spain in that situation? Well, I certainly repeat the, 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 uh, the guarantee I made, or guarantee the statement I made to, uh, in Northern Ireland last week, because the soft border, the open border, I'm not quite sure what the right phrasing is, uh, existed before either of us members of the European Union when we were separate countries with different tax rates, different VAT rates, different income tax and all the rest of it. Uh, and it seems to me entirely possible, given modern technology, we can do the same, and that we can design a... Uh, an immigration system which also copes with it. So I can certainly reiterate uh, what I said in Northern Ireland last week in front of the House. No. Mr. David Nuttall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I warmly welcome my admirable friend uh, to his new post and for his statement, the first of what will no doubt be many to this House. Mr. Speaker, on the 22nd of June, the day before the referendum, the FTSE closed at uh, 6,261. Uh, today it is over 6,800, yeah, up 10 per yeah. cent. Does my right honourable friend agree that this tells us all we need to know about investor confidence in our future, that we will be better off outside the European yeah, Union? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What it certainly tells us is that the business community is not as afraid of this great new opportunity we face. Uh, as, was, as was claimed before the referendum. But I don't want to disappear into rerunning arguments uh, of the Leave campaign. I'll, I'll, I'll say this as well. Uh, market movements in stock markets are volatile and small uh, uh, and often uh, uh, reverse themselves. What doesn't reverse themselves are large inward investments. And in the year in which our party committed to give a referendum, we had the largest inward investment in our history, I think. Alan Brown. Mr Speaker, can I congratulate the Secretary of State? He's clearly learning lessons from the Leave campaign because he's came today and said nothing at all. His statement was 15 minutes of waffle and sound bites. Yeah. We've had national consensus, interests of the entire nation, one nation. Now that is completely at odds with the fact that 62% of electorate in Scotland voted to remain. Now also does not bode well for meaningful input for the Scottish Government. Now, can you also confirm the claim that was made during the campaign by his honourable uh, member for North Somerset that Scotland would suddenly have control of a whole new raft of powers, yeah. including immigration, or is that another piece of nonsense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think my right honourable friend was referring to immigration. I suspect he was referring to fishing, and what will certainly be the case, and what will certainly be the case is we will be taking back control of uh, UK fishing rights. Nigel Adams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I also congratulate my right honourable friend and parliamentary neighbour on uh, his appointment, an inspired choice. Um, while he's been in the role um, these short few weeks, has he had a, an opportunity, has he seen any evidence of contingency planning across any department in Whitehall prior to the referendum, uh, the potential that the uh, British public might have voted to leave the European Union. It struck, strikes me in a two-horse race, it might have been an idea to have a look at this possibility. Um, and also, furthermore, um, given that we're going to have to look at all these different laws and 12,000 plus EU regulations that affect our lives, what progress is the government making on making sure we recruit the brightest minds to ensure we do this properly? Yeah. Well, the, the, the first thing is, since my department really didn't exist before I arrived, 
Um, it's, uh, it's really rather hard to find documents that relate to anything before now. I'll say this to him, that there was certainly some planning done on the financial side to deal with any financial turbulence because, as he saw, the bank and the Treasury did certain, uh, undertook certain measures. Uh, with respect to the department itself, I mean, it is, I, I, I brushed across it, but it, is, it says something that the department quadrupled in size in August. And he, from his days as PPS, will remember what Whitehall's like in August. It's empty. So uh, we were not short of applicants. And we do really have the brightest and best applying to help us. And that's uh, and not just my department, but also in uh, the Department of International Trade as well. So uh, I will be confident about that. Mr. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. In his statement, the Secretary of State, who I welcome to his post, uh, reaffirmed the promise of the Chancellor that all structural uh, and investment fund projects signed before the autumn statement will be underwritten by the Treasury as we leave. We've got a little bit of a quandary on behalf of the people of Greater Manchester because we've been allocated to 2020 £322 million in European structural investment funds, but £157.9 million of those have not yet been contracted. They're currently held up in Whitehall departments, predominantly this Department for Communities and Local Government and the Department for work and pensions. Can he ensure that the people of Greater Manchester get all £322 million that has been allocated to it by the European Union and not the lesser amount that has already been approved by government? What I will do is draw his request to the attention of the Chancellor. Paul Moon. My right hon. Friend on his well-deserved appointment. 61% of the people of Kettering voted to leave the European Union and they want to make sure that he's got the tools to finish the job. And following the question from our right honourable friend about staff numbers, he says that he's got 180 at the moment. How many does he need? And given that his department hopefully will no longer exist in two years' time, what incentive is there for the brightest and best civil servants who have long-term civil service careers in mind to join his department? And what incentives are there to attract people into his department from the private sector? The, the, the first thing in terms of incentive, I mean, we barely need an incentive. They want to be at the centre of the most important change in our uh, historic change in, uh, in what's happening uh, in, in the last decade or two or three. So there, I don't think that's a problem. There are uh, arrangements being made precisely because we disappear when this process is over to ensure that there's continuity and to ensure that they go seamlessly back into the, uh, the Whitehall system, although I rather suspect at the end of it there will be lots more bids for them than that. Stuart Blair Donaldson. Speaker, membership of the European Union allows young people in Scotland the freedom to easily live, learn and work across Europe, and they voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU. What assurances can the Secretary of State give to young people living in my constituency that these benefits and freedoms will be retained after Brexit? Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a good, uh, good question, and I think that uh, I would expect us to ensure that we get uh, freedoms at least as good as the, those that are there now. I mean, one of the, one of the things that's very important uh, in, the, in, in the European Union, but in, in, in Britain in particular, is we are a science superpower. We have, we have a fa fabulous education system. We have some of the best uh, universities in the world, uh, and we have some of the best students in the world. And uh, I think we'll reflect that in the, with, with the outcome in a few years' time. Mr David Morris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to congratulate my friend on his new position. Um, speaking as a parliamentarian that has never seen my honourable friend in action, it's an absolute pleasure to watch him. <laughs> anyway, enough of all that. I'll get down to the nitty gritty. In my blunt northern way, I would like my honourable friend to look into uh, VAT. As you know, it was a purchase tax before 1973. It's now VAT. It's fluctuated over the years, up, down, whatever. But there are so many small businesses out there that do need a taper relief for VAT, because when they hit the threshold, it can actually kill them off. I know I was a small businessman. I actually succeeded through that, but it was a problem. Would my honourable friend please look into this for the small business people of the United Kingdom? I will, I will firstly, I'll draw the attention of the Treasury of it, uh, to it, and I'll also make sure that we think about it when we go through this process. Anna Johnson. Mr. Speaker, can I congratulate my parliamentary neighbour on his appointment? And as he knows, the Humber estuary is fast becoming the UK energy estuary, with Siemens investing massively in Hull with the potential to export to the single market. And so trade deals with Australia aren't really going to cut it 
in Hull. So I wondered whether uh, the Secretary of State would agree to meet with a delegation from the Humber to actually make sure that the green energy industry uh, benefits from the huge and exciting opportunities that the uh, Minister has talked about. <coughs> How could I say no to meet a delegation from the Humber? It would be so difficult to organise. The, um, the, but what I will say as well is that Siemens was one of the companies that said that they were going to continue investment in the UK, and that was something of a change from what was the case before the referendum. So, yes, of course. Jen Rick. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was delighted to hear my right hon friend say that he'd begun the huge task of going sector by sector to assess the undoubted challenges that many parts of the British economy will face. But can I ask him to add a second column to his spreadsheet for the opportunities that those sectors may have and that may arise from Brexit. We all know from every industry and business that we've worked in that there will be areas of promise from leaving the European Union in terms of uh, particularly getting away from onerous, excessive European regulations which hold back British economic sectors. Will my right friend create a parallel process of assessing those regulations so that we can be in a good position as soon as we leave. Yeah, yeah. It's a good point, and we are actually on it already. I mean, the opportunity side of the spreadsheet, as he puts it, uh, is uh, integral to the process, uh, and some of them have already reported back. But this is a. We are challenging some of the things that are coming back as well, because you, you get some, a degree of special pleading as well. So we, it takes a little longer than just asking the question. But yes, we're doing it. Nick Thomas Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In June, Vote Leave issued a letter. It was co signed by the Foreign Secretary, and it was unequivocal that the levels of funding constituencies like mine currently receive from the European Social Fund would continue post Brexit. <coughs> Will the Secretary of State repeat that guarantee from the dispatch box today, or was that letter simply worthless? Well, unless he wasn't listening earlier, I said that I'm putting in the uh, library the letter from the Chancellor Exchequer on structural funds. Exactly that. Scott Mann. Yeah, yeah. Can I welcome my right honourable friend to his place? Uh, one of the greatest opportunities for Cornwall, particularly presented by leaving the European Union, is uh, reclaiming the UK's territorial fishing waters. Yeah, yeah, uh, will, yeah, yeah, yeah. will my right honourable friend commit to not use this natural resource as a bargaining chip as part of the wider deal and embrace the opportunities that this could deliver to coastal communities like mine and elsewhere around the UK? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I've never had so many attempts to seduce me into making promises uh, as I have today. Um, I've, I've said to uh, his honourable friend already that uh, this will be one of the gains from the uh, European Union negotiation, but there may be some internal negotiations within it. I mean, if you speak to his own fishermen, you'll see what I mean. Yeah, I mean Newlands. Mr Speaker, following the referendum in which Rimshire voted 2-1 to, to remain, mm -hmm. I wrote to businesses across Rimshire to offer any support I could and visited many businesses and institutions during the summer recess. Mr Speaker, they are all desperate for information, but shamefully during the statement the Secretary of State offered nothing but double talk, prevarication and assertions. Yep. When can EU citizens and businesses across Rimshire expect some detail to emerge on what Brexit will entail and what the Government plan to spend the Foreign Secretary's £350 million a week windfall on? Yeah, let's yeah. Well, I repeat what I've said already, that the, uh, that the information will become available as we work through the process. And, if, and if, he, if he somehow imagines that this is a sort of Lego block process that anybody could do without thinking about it, I suggest he looks again. Tommy Shepherd. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In welcoming the Secretary of State to his position, could I ask him if he appreciates that the appetite of people in Scotland for a further independence referendum, and indeed the way they might vote in such a referendum, in very large part depends upon the response that he and his government now make to their decision to reject by a large majority the separation from the European Union. We were promised in 2014 that Scotland would be respected within this United Kingdom. So can I ask him if proposals emerge in the months ahead which offer the prospect of separate and different arrangements between Scotland and the European Union, Will he listen to them and consider them in good faith, or will he reject them out of hand? Before I answer his question, may I apologise to the Honourable Gentleman for the late return of his letter that uh, he wrote to me earlier in the summer, but we did try to give him some facts in it. The, uh, the, uh, with respect to the uh, discussions with the uh, 
uh, devolved administration with the Scottish Government uh, and other devolved administrations. I say this first up, that there is a, a joint ministerial committee of which the First Minister has been offered a place, or her nominee has been offered a place, whichever she wishes, uh, and that will be the process by which we look at all, uh, all proposals. The Prime Minister said we'll look at all proposals. Um, now, the one he suggests, I can't see how it would work, I really can't, but uh, we'll look at it. I know, we'll look at it. But I, I have to say to him, right up front, as I said to the First Minister when I spoke to her about it, I actually can't see how that can be made to work. Ian C. Lucas. I congratulate the Honourable right Gentleman on his appointment. On immigration controls, can he indicate whether it is the position of the, the UK Government to continue to differentiate in the future between entry restrictions for citizens of the EU and for those from outside the EU? All I can say to him is this. My task is to get the control of that process back to the Government and back to Parliament. It's for Government and Parliament to decide how they use it. But the, but the simple truth is that I expect us to see a much more even-handed policy in the future than we have now, but I think we must wait until the negotiation is complete. Margaret Ferrier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's clear on these benches that the Government's handling of the withdrawal from the EU has been nothing short of a disgrace, and the lack of leadership shown by the new Prime Minister has done nothing to quell the fears of both UK citizens and EU nationals living on these islands. Does the Secretary of State not agree that the only person who has shown any leadership and forward thinking on Brexit is the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon? Well, I, I must say, Mr Speaker, what I thought she was going to say was uh, Ruth Davison, who won the popularity contest this time round. But, but, you know, I have, I have to say something, something else about, about the Scottish nationalist approach to this. You know, our new Prime Minister, before she even did her reshuffle, went to Scotland to see the First Minister of Scotland. How much more respect you can pay to another politician than that, I do not know. And what gratitude do we get for it? What we've just heard. Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. I'll let the House in on a secret of mine. Back in 2008, when the Secretary of State resigned his seat over civil liberties, I sent him an email as a young 22-year-old wishing him all the best in that election. I've been an admirer of him despite our differences since then. But I have to say I'm disappointed with the weakness in the statement he's given to the House today. My constituency voted over 70 per cent to remain, the highest in the city of Glasgow. But they will expect me to get the best deal in the circumstances that we are in. So with that in mind, can he outline to us what powers he envisages that the Scottish Parliament will gain as a result of the Brexit vote and when he expects those powers to be implemented? It, it, firstly, it depends very much on what is agreed in the negotiation. But the second thing I will say to him is this. Um, the undertaking that was given was to do everything possible to protect all of the interests of all of the parts of the United Kingdom and Scotland, of course, uh, 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 at the front rank of those, of those people. Now, that's what's going to happen. The issue is not about giving powers to politicians. It's about looking after the interests of the people. Uh, and uh, and that, is, that is what will happen. We will look after the interests of everybody in the United Kingdom, including Scotland. Yeah. Order. I thank the Secretary of State, the opposition frontbench spokespersons and all 85 backbenchers who have the opportunity to question the right honourable gentleman. I'm sure there will be other instalments to follow in due course.